Welcome to the 2018-19 South Carolina High School League online rules presentation. My name is Charlie Winsky, Assistant Commissioner at the South Carolina High School League. I'll be reviewing the first 10 slides which pertain to South Carolina High School League information only. At the conclusion of the first 10 slides, the Commissioner responsible for your sport will then take over and go through the rule changes that pertain to your sport for the 2018-19 school year. Contact information for the South Carolina High School League is on the first slide. Phone number is 798-0120, area code of 803. We're in the office from the hours of 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday from August through May. In the months of June and July, we are closed on Fridays. South Carolina High School League website was updated last year www.schsl.org. Any information you want to find on the National Federation, you would go to the National Federation website, which is nfhs.org. And all the courses that we're going to talk about in these first 10 slides that are required of coaches to take can be found at www.nfhslearn.com. In addition to the required courses of coaches, there are also sports specific coaching courses, sportsmanship course as well as a host of other educational opportunities at nfhslearn.com. Highly encourage you all to take a moment to look at the available courses and to take any courses that interest you or that can further educate you in your sport. Our five approved healthcare professionals that can return an athlete to play with symptoms of a concussion or diagnosing of a concussion, an MD, a DO, a PA, an MP or an athletic trainer. Athletic trainer is probably the most common available to every school throughout the state during the entire school year. It's often the case you may have an MD or a DO on the sideline during a football game. In absence of one of these five, if an athlete is suspected of having a concussion, the official is going to send them off the field and they are not to return under any circumstance. If they're sent off for concussion-like symptoms and one of these five healthcare professionals is present, they can test and diagnose and return to play or test, diagnose, and sit out. But remember, in absence of one of these five, student athlete will sit out. Remember the old saying we've used for years, when in doubt, sit them out. Don't ever risk an athlete's help over the opportunity to win a game. Coaching requirements. South Carolina High School League requires all coaches at all levels to take the following three courses. Concussion course, heat acclimatization course, and the sudden cardiac arrest course. These three courses are not new. They've been required for the last two years. The concussion course has been in place for a number of years now. Uh, if you've been uh, coaching for a while, you understand that occasionally these courses get updated. The concussion course has been updated for this year with some new information added to it so it should have a little different feel when you watch it this year uh, in some areas. When you get done with these courses, print out your certificate, give them to your athletic director or principal to keep on file so that you have proof you've taken these courses. Reminder, that's for all coaches at all levels. If they're a volunteer coach, required to take them. If they're there one day a week, required to take them. Full-time paid, required to take it. Middle school only, required to take these. All coaches must take these one time each year. These should be done prior to the first day of practice. In addition to the three required courses this year, all coaches are now required to be certified in CPR and AED certification. If you remember last year, head coaches, all head coaches were required to be CPR and AED certified. This year, all coaches at all levels. Again, that includes volunteers, those that are there one day, those that are there just for games, middle school coaches, sub-varsity coaches are required to be CPR certified in addition to um, the uh, required online courses you must view. Coaches, this is nothing new. For athletic directors have known about this um, since last year. We 
we made it known that the head coaches were required last year, but moving forward, all coaches would be required. So this is nothing new. If you have any questions on CPR AD certifications, speak to your athletic director. If you're a non-district employee and you're a head coach, a reminder that you must take the fundamentals of coaching course in addition to all the requirements we've gone over already. Fundamentals of coaching course can be found at nfhslearn.com. Make sure you select Fundamentals of Coaching and select South Carolina so that you don't take a Fundamentals of Coaching course for another state. Again, when you get, complete that course, print your certificate out, give it to your athletic director or principal to keep on file. Okay, some general reminders for all head coaches. Beginning the 2018-19 school year, a wet bulb globe thermometer must be used throughout the year. Um, this instrument will help determine safe conditions in times of high heat and humidity. Again, this is required. For those of you that coach an indoor sport or at different times outside of the fall, please understand this is not isolated to just a football practice or a cross-country practice or an outdoor practice in the fall. High heat and humidity could be present inside of a gymnasium with no air conditioner. It could also show itself through the winter months or through the spring given the extreme changes in temperature that we have in our state. If you have an athletic trainer, please take a moment before your season starts to become familiar with what a wet bulb globe reading is and the options that you have when it's determined that conditions are not safe to practice full out. If you have any questions, please visit our website. On our website, you'll be able to find uh, the wet bulb globe guidelines in the event that your reading requires you to modify your practice in some way. Again, this is a safety issue that's put in place this year in an effort to reduce the opportunity for heat stroke and heat exhaustion. Don't jeopardize an athlete's health under any circumstances. Again, for 2018-19, Rawlings balls must be used in the postseason. The only exception for this are in sports of football, lacrosse, golf, and tennis. If your sport requires the use of Rawlings balls, please plan accordingly and have balls readily available in the event you host a home playoff game. The balls should be used throughout the contest. You're responsible for making sure that you have quality balls to start the contest with. This is nothing new. We've been doing this for the last couple years. Reminder, Rawlings balls must be used in the postseason. Communicate with your opponents, your start times, your play dates, and your locations. Often, many coaches make schedules six to eight months in advance. Sometimes there's coaching changes at schools. Often, people make changes inadvertently in their schedule without notifying everyone. So prior to your season starting, please take a moment, communicate with all of your opponents, head coaches, and athletic directors to verify that you have the correct play date, start time, and location. A number of issues throughout our league in the last few years where schools have shown up at different locations to play each other, where simple communication prior to could have avoided any conflicts the day of. So take a few minutes, communicate, and get it all squared away. Coaches, don't rely on other coaches, your peers, coaches other schools, coaches in your region to answer questions about the league. If you have a question about the league as it pertains to the rules and regulations, the bylaws, or the Constitution, or the brackets, ask your AD or principal first. If he or she does not know the answer to your question, have them call us. Remember, the only interpretation that's the official interpretation comes from our league. We've had a ton of changes to our bylaws and regulations in the last few years. Many times coaches who have been coaching for a number of years don't recognize all the changes that have been made and may lead you down a wrong path inadvertently. All coaches are responsible for knowing what is in the South Carolina High School League handbook 
make sure that if you don't know the answer to a question, you ask your AD or principal first. If they can't answer the question, have them call us. And remember, all official interpretations come out of our office. Continue with general reminders. Make sure your officials have clean, secure dressing facilities, optimal space to move around. The biggest thing is that they're clean and then they're able to be secured during the contest. And if you have a contest, please make sure that you have some sort of security opportunity for the officials to get escorted back to their vehicles or out of the stadium or facility. That security could be an athletic administrator or an administrator at your school or your game manager in the event you don't have uniform security available. But you need someone to be able to help escort those officials to a secure location and then to their vehicles when the contest is over. This day and age where parents and fans are increasingly becoming vocal about their displeasure for officiating, we don't need any situations where officials are being bombarded post-contest because security was not offered. Social media. Remember, negative comments about officials, other schools, other fan bases, or the South Carolina High School League will not be tolerated on social media. If you have a school account, whether it's ran by a student, or ran by a parent, or ran by a school employee, that makes these negative comments and you will be responsible for those comments as a school. Coaches and athletes who have their own personal accounts, any negative comments about officials or other schools or other fan bases could subject you to a fine and or other punishments accordingly from the rules and regulations. Remember, keep social media clean and keep it positive. Living Clean Weeks. Our Living Clean Weeks initiative, we started three years ago. This will be the third year of this initiative. We have three weeks, one in each sports season. You can see the dates here in front of you. Our goal for these three weeks is that we're ejection-free statewide and that each school participates in a community-wide cleanup. On the ejection-free piece, the idea here is that you spend time as a coach leading up to the week in your season that's ejection-free really promoting the importance of positive sportsmanship and being ejection free. Our goal is that every school in the state will go through that week without an ejection of any kind. The second piece to the goal is a community-wide cleanup. We want to be our schools to be intentional about their efforts in their community to help clean up their community. We certainly don't discourage you from going to the elementary school and reading to students, opening car doors, doing canned food drives, gathering clothes for the homeless. But those are not community-wide cleanups. Community-wide cleanups would entail cleaning up your school grounds full of litter, finding someone in the community who needs help restoring their property, participating in a Palmetto Pride event such as Adopt a Highway, Combine these two in schools that combine ejection-free and community-wide cleanup with their athletes are determined a gold school for that week. If you do one of the two, you're determined to be a silver school. And if you have an ejection and don't do any community-wide cleanup, you're, you get no recognition for that week. Our goal is to have all member schools listed each week. Okay, an update for you is that uh, for those of you that are familiar with our system, Planet HS, that handled all of our eligibility, uh, pitch counts in baseball, transfers, uh, Planet HS is now Arbiter Athlete, which I'm sure you're aware of because you had to go to Arbiter Athlete to view this online rules clinic. But understand that Planet HS no longer exists. They have merged with Arbiter Sports and are, are now Arbiter Athlete. For those of you coaches who are familiar with Arbiter game as it pertains to your game officials assignments and who will and will not be working your contest, while it's under the same umbrella of Arbiter, it's not the same system. 
So you can't just go to your Arbiter game website where your officials are located and get all the information that's in Arbiter Athlete. Same family of company, different websites. Please keep that in mind as you move forward through the school year. Ejections. I'll quickly walk you through the process of what happens when you have a student athlete who is ejected from a contest. So you're at a contest, you have a student athlete or a coach who's ejected from a contest. Game's over, match is over. First thing you really need to do as a head coach is you need to notify either your principal or your athletic director that someone was ejected from your team. High probability is that they're going to get a phone call or an email from us immediately the next morning making them aware they had an ejection in the contest before. I can tell you as the person that deals with ejections every day in our office, 40% of the time ADs and coaches are not aware. Do yourself, do your school's favors by making your AD and or principal aware that you had an ejection during the contest as soon as your contest is over or first thing the next morning. Schools are required to submit the form for an ejection by noon the following day. In absence of you submitting a form, we don't have anything to go by from the school side. Too often than not, schools will call and say, we were waiting to see what the official said to turn our report in. That's not how this works. We need to know your side of it and the official side so that we can best come to a decision. We don't need to know your story after you read the official story. If you know your student athlete was guilty of an objectionable offense, just say, I know they were guilty. They deserve to be ejected. It's not going to cause more punishment than they already were going to get in the first place. It just makes the whole process a little bit easier on our end. When you write your reports, make sure you report facts, not opinions. Video everything. There's no excuse in this day and age not to have video. Almost every sport uses technology of some sort to practice or re record stats or to record keep. It takes little to no effort to set up a video camera and record a wide angle of the entire field or court during a contest. Instruct your videographers, don't turn the camera off. Keep it running. Football coaches, biggest problem we run into every year is that camera operators, as soon as the player that has the ball is tackled or the play is blown dead, videographers stop the play. Understandably, you want to be able to cut your video so that you don't have one play that lasts for four quarters. But tell those videographers to allow for two to three yards of separation of every player before turning off the camera. If an incident were to break out in any sport where the videographer knows the camera is off, tell them to turn it back on immediately so the video can capture as much information needed for the investigation. Many times this past year alone, we've had numerous athletes ejected from contests that were disputed due to fights or altercations. Without video, we have to go with what the official says happened. Don't leave it up in the air. Video can exonerate you if you were not guilty. The most important thing we have is we want to get those that were guilty but we also want to get those that were innocent cleared to play. Once we come to a ruling, we will send that ruling to the principal as soon as possible. Okay, piggybacking on ejections, remember the penalties for an ejection. If you're a coach and you're ejected, whether you're a head coach or an assistant coach, you're ejected during the regular season or the postseason, The penalty is a minimum next game suspension and a minimum fine of $300. If you're ejected from the last contest of the year as a head coach, that penalty becomes a $500 fine. Coaches, again, being the person that deals with ejections on a daily basis, I can tell you, once you've been ejected by an official, however rightly or wrongly you feel it was, 
the best thing you can do is walk away. The worst thing you can do is continue to engage that official in any capacity. Walk away from the situation, move on, and let us deal with the ejection the next day. If it was wrongfully ejected, we'll reinstate you. But don't do anything to create a situation where the fine is going to go up and the game suspension is going to go up. All you can do by arguing further is increase your opportunities for your minimum next game to become two, three, four, five, or six games or your minimum fine to increase to 400, 500, 600, however high we have to go. Don't give yourself the opportunity for those increases. Another informational point, coaches, is that almost every sport requires two opportunities for you to make bad decisions to become ejected. And if you know you've got a personal foul, or you know you've got a technical, or you know you've been warned, or you know you've been given a yellow card, be mindful of that as you move yourself through the rest of the contest. Be mindful of that once you get that first warning. Don't continue in anger and to continue to berate the officials and be upset because they got you again really quick. Don't give them an opportunity to do anything. Make it really easy on yourself. Talk to your kids. Coach your kids from that point only. Don't reference the officials. Don't question the officials. Don't argue. Don't get loud. Don't give yourself another opportunity to get that second penalty. If you do that, you'll stay around in almost every contest. Reminder, player ejections. In the sports of football, lacrosse, competitive cheer, and swim, any player who is ejected will be subject to a minimum next game suspension. In all other sports, the minimum becomes two games. Again, football, competitive cheer, swim, and lacrosse is a minimum next game. In all other sports, it's a minimum next two games. Remember, that is the immediate next game and the immediate next two games. Sometimes timing is, uh, is unfortunate for our student athletes. The next game may be homecoming. The next game may be senior night. The next game may be the semis in the state finals. Timing is unfortunate. The decision to be unsportsmanlike was a choice the student athlete made. Unfortunately, choices have consequences. When they choose to be unsportsmanlike, the consequence comes with game suspension. Remind your athletes, those are the minimums. We've had a number of issues this past year where student athletes were using profanity and disrespectfully addressing officials. This is not going to be tolerated by our office or the league. Student athletes who are using profanity towards the officials will get more than the minimum. Make them aware. Do not disrespectfully address a game official and do not use profanity towards a game official. We would not allow a student in a school to use profanity towards a school administrator with no consequence. During an athletic contest, the official is recognized as the authority figure on the, on the field or court. We will not allow them to use profanity or disrespectfully address game officials. Reminder, coaches who are ejected, you must leave the visual confines immediately and not return. Visual confines does not mean you all can stand behind the bleachers where you don't think you can be seen. You leave where they can't see you, period. Athletes who are ejected may remain in the bench area for the remainder of the contest. Don't ever let an athlete be sent to the locker room unattended. Athletes are allowed to remain in the area unless they become a further distraction at which point the official could ask you to remove them from the bench area. But athletes who are ejected may remain from the bench area. Further, athletes who are suspended because of their ejection may be on the sideline or in the bench area of the games they're suspended provided they are not in uniform. As long as they're not in uniform, they can remain in the bench area or on the sidelines of games they're suspended. 
If they're in uniform, remember they are considered having played in the contest. Coaches and athletes, remember you are not cleared to play until our office has cleared you to play. Anyone who is ejected, anyone who is suspended due to an ejection is not cleared to play until we have cleared you. Don't assume that it's going to be voided or overturned. If you've been ejected, they sit out until we've cleared them to play. Okay, beginning this year, the open close season schedule as you've known it for the past four or five years no longer exists. South Carolina High School League had a sports season review committee composed of principals and athletic directors across each classification. That committee worked from July of 2017 through April of 2018, formulating um, sports season review proposals. Part of that proposal was the open and closed season practice schedule. Another piece of that proposal was the number of contests, which we'll go over in the next slide. Understand it's important for you to know that all schools had an opportunity to provide input throughout the year at classification meetings. Our classification gave each member of the sports season review committee an opportunity to share with the classifications what they were doing, what, op what options they had decided or come up with at that point in time. And every AD had an opportunity and every principal had an opportunity to go back to their coaches and share this information to get feedback. This was not a one week or one month wonder that was put together in a hurry. This process took time and the committee worked very hard to iron out where we are now. Again, all schools had an opportunity for input throughout the year through your principal and athletic director. So with that being said, our new open and closed practice schedule is as follows. All sports will be allowed 20 days of practice during your open season. Football and lacrosse will be given 10 days in pads. So if you're in the sport of football or lacrosse, 10 of your 20 days may be in pads. All other sports, you have 20 days of practice during your open period to use as you see fit. Schools are responsible for having the file day, on file the dates you used, so the dates that you practiced during your open period, you need to have on file so that your athletic director has them in the event they're questioned encourage you to have this on file because chances are most of your parents will be the ones that will challenge you or a disgruntled parent or someone in the community will be the one that challenges that you practice more than 20 days. Remind that open and closed season schedule cannot be mandatory. You cannot use it as a tryout period and you cannot make cuts. You have no limit with how many athletes you can work with during these 20 days. The open season dates, if you're a fall sport, your open season dates for this school year will be May 1st through 31, 2019. Your winter sports will be September 10th through October 24th, 2018. And if you're a spring sport, you have December 3rd, 2018 through January 23rd, 2019 to get your 20 days of practice in. Again, you have those periods to get your 20 days of practice in. Spring sports and winter sports, there's a four-day dead period or closed period prior to your season starting. So in other words, winter sports, you have till October 24th, which I believe is a Wednesday, and then that Thursday through Sunday will be closed again until you open up official team practice on Monday. Spring sports will be the same. January 23rd should be a Wednesday. And then you have Thursday through Sunday, which is closed prior to your season opening on Monday. Fall, obviously, you have May 1 through 31, which then rolls right into June 1 through your closed period four-day prior, which is the South Carolina Athletic Coaches Association Clinic in late July. 
So your fall sports, you have May 1 through 31, and then roll right into your summer practice months. During a closed season, sports-specific skills may not be taught. Only strength and conditioning programs can be ran during closed seasons. Now remember, strength and conditioning can include agility programs provided they're not sports-specific skills. The change to the open and closed season practice schedule will have no impact as it pertains to the 75% rule for outside teams. So there's no change in your ability to run an outside team provided you follow the 75% rule. I'm getting a lot of calls on that from coaches in the first few months of this coming out. No change to the 75% rule as it pertains to outside teams with this closed and open season schedule. And new for this year's number of contests. You see here in front of you the sports of basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, tennis, and lacrosse. In the past, these sports were offered a number of regular season games plus a number of tournaments. We're no longer getting into how many tournaments you can or can't play. We're just limiting your number of games. You can play any combination of games through tournaments or regular season to reach your max. I'm a basketball coach and I want to schedule four tournaments that have four games each and play 10 regular season games. That would be 16 tournament games and 10 regular season games to reach my 26. That's fine. If I wanted to play 24 regular or 26 regular season games and no tournaments, that's fine. If I want to play in one four game tournament and 22 regular season games, that's fine. The key is that every time you play now, whether it's in a tournament or a regular season game, you count that as one contest. And remember that any contest you play in the preseason must be in a tournament. And that contest counts towards your total number of contests. So if you play in a preseason tournament for four games in that tournament, then you would subtract those four games from your total number. That would leave you with 22 games to play during the regular season. You cannot play a regular season game or a single game prior to the official start date of your regular season. Any games played prior to that official start date must be played through a preseason tournament. And remember, those games count towards your total number of contests. An athlete is limited to the same number of games as the team. So there's no combination that an athlete can exceed playing the max number a varsity team can play. Example, a ninth grader who plays softball would have 24 games. They could play at JV and then come up and play two games at the varsity level. Remember, dressed in uniform and on the bench or sideline area is considered participating. If I'm a girls basketball player and I wear a uniform and I sit on the bench for 25 games and I never go in, by our rules, you've considered participating in 25 games. Please keep that in mind as you move athletes up and down. Brackets. I want to take a minute to kind of walk you through how brackets come to be. Every year we get calls from coaches wanting to know the how or the why the brackets are the way they are, who set these brackets. Um, sometimes there's a misbelief that we set them in our office. So we'll take a minute to walk you through how brackets get to be brackets. Uh, first of all, by rule, brackets for the state championships are to be set by the commissioner. However, our commissioner currently allows each classification to structure and organize their brackets as it pertains to that classification. In other words, 5A gets to determine how many qualifiers from each region, what those region matchups in the playoffs will look like, and who will be designated the home team throughout the playoffs to the semifinals. 
Each classification has the same opportunity to do that. So 1A through 5A has the opportunity to determine who qualifies, what those matchups will be in the playoffs, and then who the designated home team will be. Understand those brackets are set for a two-year period. They're set based on realignment. So those brackets are set in for two years. Brackets from this year should be different from the brackets that we see next year. The only thing that our office sets are the dates. With that, reminder that dates mu games must be played on the original scheduled date by the bracket. Should both teams agree, you can always move a game a day early. You can never move a game back for any reason unless it's a weather-related reason that causes us not to be able to play the game due to weather. Games must be played on the original scheduled date unless both schools agree to move it up a day. You can never move it back a day for any reason unless weather dictates you cannot play it on the original scheduled date. Okay, so once the, the bracket committee for each classification put together proposals, each principal and athletic director had an opportunity at the principals and ADs conference in March, and in some cases, in some classes, additional opportunities through email to have input into the brackets that will be used for the 18 to 2020 school years. Reminder, we're starting a new realignment period this fall, so you may have similar matchups in your brackets that you experienced this past year. An example of that, Team A went to Team B in the semifinal round during the 2017-18 school year. In the 2018-19 school year, Team A may go back to Team B in the semifinal round again. The reason for that is we're in a new realignment period. Names and faces and regions have changed. Region numbers have changed. Some schools have gone from the upper to the lower. Your classification is not the same classification that it was a year ago. Therefore, your brackets could dictate repeat matchups in the same rounds based on the fact that schools have changed. You could have gone from Region 3 to Region 4 and now end up playing the same team who's in 1, whereas you played them in 3 last year, but now you're in 4. You can understand why you could have similar matchups. But the brackets for this year are totally new and are set by each classification. If you have any questions on your brackets, talk to your athletic director. and They can direct those questions to the president of your classification. This concludes the first 10 slides that pertains to the South Carolina High School League information. I appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. This time I'm going to turn it over to the commissioner responsible for your sport. I wish you all the best of luck during your season, and if you ever have any questions, feel free to contact our office. My name is Skip Wax, and this is the 2018-19 Online Rules Clinic for Soccer. I've listed here uh, my email address, as well as uh, phone numbers to be reached, as well as websites for the High School League and the National Federation. Welcome to the 2018-19 Soccer PowerPoint presentation. Your NFHS rules book is available now as eBooks. There is also a new NFHS rules app as well. The following are the 2018-19 Federation Soccer Rules changes. Rule 4-1, 1A, B, alters the jersey colors required for teams such that the home team wears dark jerseys and socks and the visiting team wears all white jerseys and socks. Illustrated here, player A is on the home team and is required to wear the dark colored jersey and dark socks. Player B is part of the visiting team and is required to wear an all white jersey and all white socks. Rule 411D allows for visible undergarments to be worn if they are of similar length and of a solid color. Illustrated here, play pick A shows the home team members wearing light color undergarment. Play pick B shows the visiting team wearing the all white jersey and socks with blue shorts and tights. 
illustrated here in play picks A and C are examples of uh, undergarments that would be illegal whereas play picks B and D show examples of undergarments which would be legal. Rule 4.2.10 allows for state associations to permit the wearing of head coverings or wraps if criteria is met for medical, cosmetic, and or religious reasons. Illustrated here in play pick A and B, both items would be legal and would will require appropriate documentation showing state association approval to be allowed. Rule 812 allows the kicker on a kickoff to be in the opposing team's half of the field to make the kick. Illustrated here, the player taking the kickoff may be on the opposing team's side of the field to start the kickoff. All other players must be on the designated side of the field for their team. Rule 11.1.4 clarifies that a player in an offside position who becomes involved in an active play must be penalized. Illustrated here, A2 is in an offside position when A1 plays the ball. A2 runs from the offside position into her own half of the field and plays the ball. A2 is offside as she was in an offside position when the ball was played. The restart for offside is an indirect free kick taken at the spot where A2 touched the ball. Rule 12.8.1F, 12.8.1.5, 12.8.2.D, 12.8.2.D, 3 and 4 clarify the penalty for a player who denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity. 12.8.1F, 15, misconduct, player B1 while attempting to play the ball trips the attacking player A1 in the penalty box, denying an obvious goal scoring opportunity. The referee awards the opponents a penalty kick, issues a caution to B1. 12-8-2-D-3, 4, misconduct, player B1 with no attempt to play the ball trips the attacking player A1 outside the penalty box. Denying an obvious goal scoring opportunity, the referee awards the opponents a direct free kick and issues a red card to B1. Rule 13 j provides a penalty for a player or players, coach or bench personnel who enters or leaves the field without permission from an official and interferes with play or an official. 13 j Free kick when awarded, a player, coach, or bench personnel enters or leaves the playing field without permission from the official, interferes with player, and official should be penalized with direct free kick from the point of the infraction. Rule 13.2.3 provides for a penalty for a player, players, coach, or bench personnel who enter or leave the field without permission from the official and does not interfere with play or the official. Illustrated here, the referee should blow the play dead at the appropriate time and award an indirect free kick to the opposing team at the point of the infraction. Rule 18-1G defines the deliberate act which provides guidance for interpretation of rules that contain the word deliberate or the phrase deliberate act. 18-1-1G Definitions of deliberate act illustrated here. A deliberate act is one in which a player chooses to act regardless of the outcome of that action. The following are the soccer editorial changes for 2018-19. Rule 424 clarifies that a religious medal or other religious items must be taped to the body. Illustrated here, again, players are allowed to tape to their bodies under the jersey religious symbols. The following are the points of emphasis. Denying an obvious goal scoring opportunity. The penalty associated with a player who denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity has been amended in an effort to make the penalty better fit the infraction. Now when a player commits an offense against an opponent within his or her own penalty area which denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity and the referee awards a penalty kick, the offender is cautioned if the offense was an attempt to play the ball. Formerly, this player was disqualified and penalty kick was awarded. In circumstances where there was no attempt to play the ball, 
the player is still disqualified. In evaluating whether there has been an obvious goal scoring opportunity, officials are encouraged to consider the following. Distance between the offense and the goal. The offense must be near the goal. General direction of play. The attacking players are generally headed toward the goal. Likelihood of keeping or gaining control of the ball. The player must have or be able to get control of the ball in order to score. Location and number of defenders. Not more than one defender between the attacking player and the goal. Not counting the player who committed the foul and the defenders must be able to challenge the attacking player. If any of the above considerations are missing, it is not an obvious goal scoring opportunity. Illustrated here again shows a case where the penalty associated with the player who denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity has been amended. Again, when a player commits an offense against an opponent within their own penalty area which denies an obvious goal scoring opportunity and the referee awards a penalty kick, the offender is cautioned if the offense was an attempt to play the ball. Excessive player substitutions. Concern has been expressed in situations where teams make excessive substitutions toward the end of the game in an effort to waste time. According to Rule 3-6, the referee has the discretion to stop the clock during the substitution so that this time is not lost. Further, the referee may consider this unsporting conduct and a caution may be issued to the coach of the offending team. Illustrated here is an example where there are excessive substitutes near the end of the game in an effort to waste time. The official does have the option of stopping the clock to avoid the loss of time. Situation also uh, can be considered unsporting conduct and a caution issued. Referee mechanics for indirect free kicks. When a team is awarded a free kick, it is important that the referee correctly utilize the NFHS official soccer signals and properly signal so the teams know whether the kick is direct or indirect. This is especially important if the three free kick is near the opponent's goal. For an indirect free kick, the referee must raise one arm vertically and maintain that position until the ball is touched by a second player. It is critical players know what type of free kick is occurring so the team taking the kick can properly execute the kick and the team defending knows whether a goal may be scored directly from the kick. For indirect free kicks, if the ball enters the goal directly from the kick, the restart is a goal kick. Illustrated here are the referee mechanics for indirect free kicks as well as direct free kicks. The following is information regarding NFHS officials' education. Available through the Federation are sports-specific officiating courses uh, through nfhslearn.com. NFHS officials' education sports-specific courses are offered in the following sports. Interscholastic Officiating, a uh, website that offers information and everything as a course to officials interested in officiating. An additional resource is the new NFHS video library. Another resource is the NFHS Official Association Central Hub. The following is additional information for the NFHS Learning Center. The NFHS Learning Center is professional development for all coaches, officials, administrators, parents, students, performing arts. NFHSLearn.com has free courses on a variety of subjects that could be of benefit to all. This concludes our online rules clinic in soccer. Thank you and have a great season.